as soon as they get off the train, they are told to line up, they're going to get some food. They give us a little bit bigger piece of bread and in Auschwitz. The soup that we got was not as watery as in Auschwitz. I actually had a couple pieces of vegetables in it. Get a piece of fish. We thought, we were really, this is really great. Of course, this is just another slave labor camp where uh, they're going to try to kill you through labor. And next morning, we are standing in attention, being counted. No electrified wires here, just barbed wire with the machine gun towers in the corners of the camp. Uh, my first job was to go out to the train station where we arrived, and there's this huge pile of uh, steel rails that the, rail, r the trains run on, you know. And they are pretty long, and they assign three prisoners to each of the rails. You pick it up, put it on your shoulder, and you start marching up this hill, let's say about a football field length, and you put it down, and then other prisoners pick it up and take it the rest of the way. And you go back and pick up another one, so you actually turn into a robot, which you do all day from sun up to sundown. Go from pick one up, put it down, pick one up, put it down. This thing is extremely heavy, so you switch it over to the other uh, shoulder, then you switch it back, and before you know it, your shoulders are just totally, totally painful. They start bleeding. People are falling under the weight of uh, the uh, steel rails. It's, you know, it, it, what goes through your mind is that What's going to happen here? You know, what's going to happen to me? Uh, why, why am I doing this thing? Why am I surrounding by, surrounded by people who are beating you because you're not walking fast enough? Or SS guards that will just at a whim would hit you with a rifle butt. And you just are in shock. You don't know what's happening. It's extremely scary. You don't know how long you can last. And the terrible thing that happens is that you start seeing prisoners die. And as a 16-year-old, I really don't have any experience with dead people. I have never seen a family member, no matter what age, dying. And this is terrible because I'm looking at the dead body and I'm thinking, this is somebody's father, somebody's son, somebody's husband. How terrible this is that this person will never, never make it home. And then there is something in you that sort of clicks in after a while, which is self-preservation. How, how am I going to stay alive? And something happens that you have to get yourself a goal in your head, in your brain. You've got to decide on something. So in my case, I decided on two things. Number one, I know my father is dead. I don't know what's happening to my mother and two sisters. What happens if my mother and two sisters survive and I die in the camps? How terrible it would be for them to come home and missing the father and the only son of the family. This gave me an incentive to keep going. The number two thing was, I told myself, if they kill me, they win. If I stay alive, I win. This was like on a daily basis. My chore. Every night when I went to sleep, I told myself, I'm going to wake up in the morning. Every morning I told myself, I'm going to see this day through. This is just a terrible place. It's just part of the so-called final solution of the Jews. If they didn't kill you outright, they're going to kill you through labor. I befriend a young prisoner, and I sort of have a buddy system. We try to uh, line up uh, when we go out to work to different work sites. And uh, it is just uh, month after month, more and more people are dying. And it's no problem because X number of prisoners die, new prisoners are being shipped in to replenish the number of 
uh, slave laborers. And then an interesting thing happens. One morning when we are lined up, again the young prisoners in the front, uh, the SS sergeant that stands about three meters from me says, who amongst you young prisoners speaks German? I put my hand up. That split second decision told me that if they want to kill you, why should they pick on one person? They can kill dozens or hundreds. So I figured I put my hand up. This is part of my uh, foreign language education in the, my gymnasium in, in my hometown. He says, come with me. He takes me to the gate of the camp. Here is a man in civilian uniform. And I take my head off, and I, I'm prisoner so-and-so. I rattle off my number. And he says to me, I am Mr. So-and-so. I am a civilian engineer attached to this camp. My job is to survey for the next two weeks, survey where the railroad and the other roads will be going. And I need somebody to help me with my equipment. You are going to take the wooden board with the numbers on it, and I have the tripod with the, my instrument. I'm going to tell you, stand here, face the board in my direction, and I will go way, way, way down. He scribbles his findings in, from his instrument, and then he beckons me to go there and stand there, and then this goes on. Next morning, the first thing he says to me, I see what terrible, terrible condition you people are in. And my head, my brain just doesn't want to connect. Why should this German even think that we are in terrible conditions? Why should he say this to me? And then the next thing he says, I tell you what we're going to do. Every day for the next two weeks, when we are going back to the big work site where you have to uh, attach yourself to the work party that you marched out with, uh, I will point to a barracks in the woods. This is where the SS and the civilian uh, German engineers are having their lunch. This is going to be way past lunchtime, so you don't have to worry that anybody will be in there. When I point, you go in there, go to the far corner, look under the bench. There's a piece of meat, piece of real bread, maybe some cheese or something. There's a little cup of milk, which I drink because there's no way I can put it. I put it in my pocket. I uh, come out and thank him. This is a real human being. I credit this man with saving my life. This went on for two weeks. And due to the fact that I got this extra nourishment, and I was really, really, you know, rationing myself, and I also shared some of this stuff with a new friend. And I was able to rebuild my system to the point that I was able to continue. Because I had absolutely no idea whether I'm going to be in the camps for two weeks, two months, or two years. We have heard planes flying over us. We have heard bombardments in the distance. And we knew that there was something happening. 